in today's show, we're doing an ADP battle with Dr. A, Steve Alexander from NBC Sports Edge. Michael Bolton, he's here. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. As I said, we're doing an ADP battle with Steve Alexander today. Of course, uh, Media Day started in the NBA. Probably the biggest news to come out of that was Zion Williamson had surgery on, uh, for a foot fracture. It looks like he'll be ready to go for the start of the season, but I would, I'd probably drop him down a couple of spots on draft boards just because of that foot fracture and given the size of Zion uh, and, and big man and, and feet is not a great combination. So I'd probably drop him down a little bit there. And the other big news, of course, is Bradley Beal saying he's unvaccinated. Now he is not going to have to be uh, dealing with the situation that Kyrie Irving potentially does and that Andrew Wiggins definitely does at this point in missing all home games. Because there's no um, no uh, requirement in Washington D.C. for uh, players to enter arenas to be fully vaccinated, that could change. But it does mean that if he is exposed to COVID, and we know he did already have that COVID issue that uh, forced him out of the Olympics, um, he's going to be subject to longer stays in the protocols. So I think that has to drop him down a couple of spots as well, because it just brings down the potential or it increases the potential of him missing more games. So I think that you take him down a few spots now and, and I think you look at guys like Jason Tatum ahead of him, obviously, and, and probably even someone like a Paul George uh, would slide ahead of Bradley Beal just because of that increased risk, I think, associated with him missing some time uh, and missing longer time than someone who is vaccinated in that same sort of scenario. That's probably the biggest news. I think Michael Porter Jr. got a uh, contract extension today. That doesn't really impact much for his fantasy pr- prospects or anything like that. But that's probably they're probably the two biggest things, I think, to come out of that. Tomorrow, we are going to be doing a mock draft. So I'm just getting a few things out of the way here before we bring Steve in. 14-team, nine-category mock draft will be on tomorrow. Um, so that's, a, that's exciting stuff. And then we're going to do more ADP battles, more mock drafts, a lot of other content coming your way as well. But before we get into talking to Steve, today's episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. Why would you? Why, why would you? Why would you spend more money? Why would you go to a local chain auto parts store or worse, a car dealership to get parts for your car? You line up, the bloke behind the counter talks to you like, yeah, mate, do you think I don't have that? I'm going to have to order it in. And then you sit there going, mate, well, why would I get you to order it? Charge me more money. But I can just do it at home. I've got a computer in my pocket on my phone. I'm like at my desk, wherever. I've got two screens. I've got two computers here. Firing up. And I can do that at rockauto.com. They are an online family business serving do-it-yourselfers for the last 20 years. Whether it's brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, or even new carpet, Rock Auto has you covered. So go to Rock Auto, find all of the parts available for your car or truck, and in their How Did You Hear About Us box, write Locked On so that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. All right, so let's bring him in now. Uh, you know him, you've seen him uh, all, all the time back at Roto World. Now, of course, uh, NBC Sports Edge. It is uh, the godfather of fantasy basketball, I guess. Dr. A, Stephen Alexander. How are you, Steve? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good. It's good to have you on here. It's been a while since you've been on the show, and we are here to uh, do what I like to call an ADP battle as we go through. We pick a, a, a randomish sort of draft spot. We put two players up, and we decide which guy we want at that at that position. Just to have a bit of a chat about these guys, how we're valuing them, and how people's opinions on players uh, can differ at these certain spots. So, Steve, I'm not gonna not gonna hold you too long. Let's get straight into it, and let's go right to the very pointy end of a fantasy basketball draft. We're at pick number two. You're sitting there at pick number two. Let's just assume Nikola Jokic is gone at number one. Pick number two. So Steph's available. Luka Doncic is available. What are you doing? I think most people who know who I am and, and can see my uh, the hat on my head probably know what I'm doing. Um, 
in the, the previous uh, two drafts I've done so far, I took Luka Doncic, but that's a, that's a me thing. Like I, if I get a chance to get Luka on my team, I'm going to do it, whether it makes sense or not, because that's, that's just how I roll. And it, at this stage of the game, I've been doing this for so long. Um, I, I like having guys on my team that I like. And, you know, when I was, when I was, very serious, um, you know, 15 years ago and trying to win every league I was in, it was all about the numbers and and it still should be for the people that are listening to this. You shouldn't, shouldn't just draft a guy because you like him. But in my case, as you said, I'm the godfather of fantasy basketball in some people's eyes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually the OG. I'm like one of the OGs, Camlin, Rick Camlin, I, I I think, and Matthew Berry were the, were the, the three, OGs, I would say. And and given that I am an OG, I have given myself um, a pass on on doing the right thing and doing what I want. So I, I like taking Luca, you know, if I can get him. Um, but, you know, if you look at the numbers, you look at the fact that Steph has Clay Thompson coming back. It looks like the Warriors are going to be a, a much better, different team this year. Um, they're kind of kind of rerun what they used to do. Um, Steph Steve's frozen there well he should hopefully he comes back soon all right we got Steve back here after some technical difficulties um Steve, I think there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not like you're taking you know, Chris Middleton at number two or you're saying, well, I really love um, you know, Wendell Carter Jr. and I'm taking him at number two. Like, There's an argument for Luka Doncic going in the top five, top four of drafts. There's certain things you need to work around with him, especially some of the free throw shooting stuff. But the counting stats are elite. We know that. Um, and if you want to go with someone who you find a little bit more enjoying, uh, enjoyable to watch, there's no problem with that. Now, I personally would take Steph there. But there's a chance that Steph, with that insane usage that he had through the last two to three months of last season, isn't able to maintain that level where he was hitting literally over six threes per game. He's going to have a lot on his plate with Andrew Wiggins not there for half the season at this point, with Clay Thompson out for the first three months. So he's going to have to be in a large usage, but maybe he's not able to maintain that over three or four months of the season. In fact, I could see if Kyrie misses 41 games that James Harden pushes into that zone at number two as well. So there are a number of different ways you can go about it. I wouldn't take Luca because I just think there are other options, but I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with just going with someone who you go, well, I want this guy. It's not an outrageous reach. So let's, let's do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I, if I, if I already have Luca in two leagues and I'm drafting a third league, I, I very well may take Steph um, just to mix it up. Cause like I said, I'm, I think Steph could have a really, really big year and and the numbers, they don't lie. He's, he's, really good yeah, he's, he's awesome like he was the number one player down the stretch last season I think post all-star break he was ahead of Jokic in that time frame as the Warriors just said well guys we need to win so let's just make Steph do everything and uh, it worked pretty well for him unfortunately they didn't get into the playoffs but if we move a little bit further down the draft well we're at pick number 22 here Jimmy Butler is sitting there Michael Porter Jr. who just signed his five-year 207 million dollar contract extension today he is sitting there obviously different ends of the age spectrum Steve which uh, direction are you going? Uh, that one is really, really easy for me. I'm going Michael Porter Jr. all day. I know Jimmy Butler's stats um, are really solid, and he um, he really doesn't have any holes in his game. But I, I just feel like he's on the wrong side of age and I, with load management and whatnot. I'm, I'm a little concerned about that, whereas Mike, Michael Porter Jr., might just be getting ready to take off and um you know he he had that COVID absence he was really the first guy last season uh that got shut down for the long extended COVID situation and uh that really hurt hurt his his hot start he was off to and I think it it took a little bit away from what he did the rest of the season so I'm all about young guys and that is what Michael Porter Jr. does. That's who he is. I uh, take him all day. But I haven't gotten him in any drafts yet because he's going so early. 
Oh, really? So he's been up. Yahoo's updated his rank to number 22. He was sitting like, I think at 40 prior to the last update. So they, they have bumped him up there. He was you know, not that high last season, but of course there is no Jamal Murray the whole year this year. So I think he's going to take a step forward. My worry with Porter, Steve, is that he, he was hitting like 45% of his threes last year and he is a proven very good three-point shooter. But there is a difference between him being a 45% three-point shooter and a 40% three-point shooter. Like 40 is still great, but if that takes your field goals from 54 down to 49, it's a giant, giant drop-off and that drops your three-pointers made and it drops your overall scoring as well. So that's somewhat of my concern with him. Whereas I do agree with you that Butler is going to fall back from where he was. But he was unbelievable last year. He was the 10th ranked player per game. And we do have to yeah, factor in that he will miss time, almost undoubtedly. He doesn't hit any threes at all. He doesn't take them. He doesn't hit any. And there's someone else who's going to be handling the ball handling duties more with Kyle Lowry replacing Kendrick Nunn, who's just not not a ball handler, not a passer, whereas Lowry is that guy. So there is going to be a drop-off in Butler. Uh, I, I, I would take Butler over Porter just because I'm valuing getting those assists and those high steal numbers versus um, what Porter does, who's, who lacks in those areas. But Porter's scoring with high efficiency is also really valuable. And I don't think... If Butler was off the board, I don't think I'd have too much of a problem taking Porter at 22. If they were both there, though, I would uh, I would lean towards Jimmy just to get those, you know, maybe six assists, maybe he pushes even higher uh, for this upcoming season. But it is it's interesting to see those two guys at the other end, the ends of their careers, one sort of trending downwards, we think, and one one pushing upwards into that uh, into that second round stratosphere. Let's go down the draft board a little bit more here, Steve. Number number 45, pick 45. So we're talking about the middle of the fourth round. Chris Middleton, who I'm seeing slip in nearly every draft that I do. He seems to slide for a guy that I think was like ranked 31st or something last season. And then you've got Karis LeVert, who we know dealt with that kidney carcinoma last season. Um, didn't play basically half the year, came across to Indiana and uh, yeah, played fairly well. Well, played really well. Now, people will look at this and they will. a lot of them will think that it is a, a, a no-brainer decision. But let, let's see what you would do in this in this spot. Well, Middleton is like Mr. Steady, slow and steady. He's boring. There's nothing. Like, it's just boring. Flat. He's he's what? He's just boring. Like, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's no excitement with what he does. He's slow and steady, and boring is a fair word. You don't you don't see him on Sports Center. You don't see him in the highlights. He's in the shadow of Giannis and Drew, but he just gets it done every time out. But. Karis is sort of like the un he's kind of an unknown because every time he seems like he's on the verge of exploding and blow, blowing up and breaking out something weird happens and and he he has a problem and gets hurt and gets shut down so but to me there's so much potential in Karis Levert um I'd like to be there when that all comes to fruition and with the Pacers um, missing T.J. Warren indefinitely, we don't know when he's going to be back. I really think this might be the year we get full-on Karis LeVert show. So I, I like Karis, but you know, I think the smart pick is probably Middleton. But if you if you like the gamble and you like uh, you like unknown upside, I, I love LeVert there. Oh, I think LeVert can average twenty points a game this season, like pretty comfortably. The problem that he has had throughout really every year of his career is subpar field goal percentage and subpar free throw percentage. Now, Steve, when he was in Indiana last year, he did push towards 80% down the stretch. If that continues, if he's able to maintain that level of efficiency, then you're right. He rises up pretty significantly because he's going to get usage. He's going to get a lot of minutes on this team. Um, yeah, TJ Warren, you're right. There's you know, an opportunity there without him to get more shots. He's going to get some ball handling as well uh, alongside Malcolm Brogdon. There's a real big opportunity for Levert, but again, I think what happens with Middleton, again, he, he's so good and he's so efficient that it just seems boring for what he does. But the fact that he's able to be you know, close to a 50, 40, 90 sort of player, that goes under the radar of just how important that can be. And you, you're seeing Middleton, who was a guy that was you know, top 35 last season. He's easily falling into the fourth round in, in so many drafts. And I guess it depends on what you've done with your early pick, Steve. If you've taken a ton of risks, there's a different way you can look at it. If you've gone with very like risky sort of players, like say you've drafted Joel Embiid, or you've taken, um, yeah, maybe you've taken Kyrie Irving in round three, and you go, well, you know, I, I need a more steady guy. Maybe we take Middleton. Or you could go the other way and say, well, I've gone all in on these guys. Let's just go all in on everyone. <laughs> and if it works out, then no one's catching me. But I've got a twenty percent chance of that happening. Now, how do you look at that? If you've gone risky pick. Embiid or Anthony Davis, they're the poster child, 
risky picks in the first and early second round. If you've gone risky, guys, do you look to you know, stabilize it with those steady players or do you just go, yeah, screw this shit, I'm just going all in? <laughs> um, I try not. I, I don't take a lot of risky uh, players. And, and just because you don't take a guy that has a reputation for being in the locker room every game and missing it uh, one game a week doesn't mean – that a guy that you you draft that plays every game every year isn't going to miss 30 games this year because Joe Johnson did it to us one year. Um, Carl, lots of players have done it. Carl to Anthony us. Towns, I mean, he didn't miss a game for Carl five Anthony years, Towns. and now he's, he missed like 30 games last year. Like nobody is impervious. Wolverine's not out there. Like nobody, nobody is impervious to getting hurt. It's literally impossible. You can't say, well, you're just soft if you sprain your ankle or break your hand. You, you can't stop it. You cannot stop And I it. think the way the world is today and the way the NBA is today with load management is, is a normal thing. Like yeah. guys sitting out a game, one out of every five games is kind of normal for, for some players. So I don't know that looking at a guy's injury history is, is as important now as it used to be because guys used to try to play 82 games and it just doesn't happen anymore. But you know, if I if I've got two guys that are super injury prone, um, backing up their position with a guy that I trust is is kind of important. Uh, Middleton, you know, the guys we're talking about, Embiid and Anthony Davis, Middleton's not going to help you at those positions if no. he goes if they go down. So I, I don't know. You know, if you're going to lose those two, you might as well lose your small forward too. Yeah, that's uh, there is yeah. You know, two ways of, of looking at that. And I don't think one's right or one's wrong. It just it depends on your your appetite for risk and whether you're just trying to like, you know, let me get to the playoffs and then I'll make my adjustments and I'll win from there rather than like, I'm just going to be this unbeatable juggernaut and no one's going to catch me if it all turns out. And that, that's really just a personal preference of how people want to approach that and how they want to uh, build their team. But if you are looking as a first-time fantasy player to bring people in to start a league, Sleeper is a new fantasy basketball product that is out there. And you guys... If you are looking at people who don't play fantasy basketball, they're coming from a fantasy football background, Sleeper might be what you need. It is a points-only format, and they use their exclusive game pick formula where you only play one game per week for the play. So you don't have to worry about who's playing three games, who plays in four games. It's scored a lot like fantasy football. So if you're looking to bring your workmates into a league or you're looking to bring your friends in and they're not familiar with the NBA, maybe Sleep is what you need. So go and download the Sleep app, start a league. The more people that play fantasy basketball, the better. Get them in, start a league, and, uh, and try out the Sleeper app. Football is also back Monday night football going on as we are recording this and all eyes are on the gridiron as teams are back for another football season. And as always, BetOnline is your number one spot for all pro and college football action this season with a new updated site and interface, even more odds, props, and contests. BetOnline.ag continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and you get a 100% welcome bonus. That is double your initial deposit, so just, just for signing up by using the promo code NFL100 from football, basketball, boxing, and right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait. Take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet online are your online sportsbook experts. All right. Pick 55. Jaron Jackson Jr., sometimes he is falling. And on ESPN, I believe he's ranked in the 90s, which is pretty ridiculous. And they might have updated that. Um, he was a guy, obviously, that killed everybody in terms of fantasy last season because the Grizzlies continue to lie in terms of when he was coming back. So he, he burnt people. Um, ESPN has updated him actually to number 81, which is still ridiculous. So he's sitting there at pick 55. Steve, you've also got another three-point shooting, scoring, shot-blocking big man who plays up in Toronto in Chris Boucher. Boucher, we saw the wild ups and downs of him last season where he would be a top 20 player and then he would not be a top 100 player because of, uh, I think, Nick Nurse's proclivities in limiting his playing time. So the ups and downs of Boucher at 55 or the Jaron Jackson, hopefully he's healthy breakout potential season. You know, I work with Jonas Nader and he is Jaron Jackson Jr.'s number one, number one fan. He's, he is his Luca. Um, he, uh, First of all, I never have JJJ on any of my teams because Jonas always gets him, and we're in we're in tons of leagues together. Uh, secondly, that last season was a absolute disaster for anybody who took him. I've got a I've got a lot of trust issues with uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. 
I, I think he's going to be really good, but we just haven't been able to see him go long enough to do anything. Now, as far as Chris Boucher goes, you're right. He was top 20 one week and he was top 150 the next week. And I don't know if, if it's because Boucher's lack of strength and, and defense uh, would make any coach angry and, and land him in a doghouse. I don't know if it's something he was doing in practice that was rubbing Nick Nurse the wrong way, but uh, he just could not get consistent minutes uh, from Nick Nurse last year. There's been changes in Tor- in Toronto. They, 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 Boucher is one of – Boucher and Ken Birch are the two big guys that are going to play minutes. So I'm hoping that Boucher gets 25 – 26 27 minutes a game he's a per minute beast and he hits threes he blocks shots i i just think there's so much potential there that if he can get on nick nurse's good side uh he could take over the world so i'm, I'm going boucher boucher is basically like christian wood before christian wood became a starter in the end of Detroit, South Houston, a guy that we always saw play in the g league and come up and play minutes ago oh my god this guy's per minute numbers are out of control and Boucher's just never been able to force his way into that role. I Do you think that he starts with Siakam out, or do you think that they push um, Scotty Barnes into that role, or do they start a Dragic, Trent, Van Vliet, one, two, and three, and push Ananobi to the four? How do you think Boucher's... Because I, I think Nurse views Boucher more as a four than as a five, and he could run Birch and, and Precious Achua at the center position exclusively. Do you think that Boucher can start out and play you know, 28 minutes as a starter, or do you think they'll keep him in that weird reserve role? You know, I, it probably depends on how training camp goes and how the communication has been, you know, over the over the summer with with Nick Nurse. If if they've patched up their differences, and, and I, I'm sure that the Raptors have put an assistant coach probably on Chris Boucher duty 24 seven and trying to get um, trying to get him where they want him, you know, mentally and also physically. Uh, but I haven't heard any, I haven't heard anything. So, but yeah, if without Siakam there, if I'm the coach of the Raptors, I'm starting Chris, Chris Boucher. So I would hope that they start him, but like you said, it could be Ken Birch and, and a couple guards. We, we don't know. So, um, but I, my gut says that he'll, he'll start. Yeah, my gut tends to be that as well. There was some comments from Media Day today saying they're going to play Scotty Barnes a ton of minutes. I'm not really sure what that means, but yeah, I, I'm not sure that yeah that means that he's coming in and playing 29 minutes or anything like that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how, how they run that, but I, I am yeah very confident that they view Boucher as a four more than a five. I, I personally would take Jackson there. That yeah, The Jackson stuff with his fouls is a problem. Injuries is a problem, but I just feel like his role on night-to-night basis is way more secure. If... If Jaron Jackson ended up as a top 20 player this year, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd never pick him there, but I wouldn't be surprised. And I'm just not sure that there's enough stability in what Boucher does to get him to that uh, to that spot. The, the last one, Steve, we're at pick 70. Kemba Walker, old man Kemba Walker with his uh, knees made out of gravy. They're sitting there. Nikhil Alexander-Walker, the young star for New Orleans, who probably is going to be their starter. He is sitting there. Now I know that Steve, you are you, you just you, you want the young guys, you want these young energetic players to, to jump into your lineup. So you're going to be telling me just steer away from Kemba Walker, correct? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Alexander Walker, do you think that the, do you think he's 100 percent going to start? Um, I I feel like it's about 80. Yeah, the, look, the other option really is Josh Hart, or I guess they could throw Sadoransky or Garrett Temple in there. That wouldn't be smart, I wouldn't think, but I, I guess they could do that. I would say that Alexander Walker is going to start, and we know, Steve, that when he's in there, there's not going to be many shots that he doesn't take. He's uh, he's fairly trigger-happy in getting those shots up. Now, getting the efficiency correct is going to be a, a challenge with him, and I, I guess your worry with Kemba is what what old Tom Thibodeau is going to do in terms of grinding him into dust. <laughs> Well, yeah, and uh, the fact that he hasn't been able to stay healthy, he's he's not a big guy. Um, man, the, the Boston experiment was was not not good. And I, I just NAW when he was a rookie, I thought he I thought he had a chance to to maybe be in the hunt for rookie of the year, but he just didn't play hardly at all his rookie season. Uh, but I I was high on him coming out of you know coming into the NBA and 
you know, we this last what 18 games last season, I think, or last 13, whatever it was, were really spectacular. And yeah, we've seen other guys do that, you know, have a great finish to a season and then go right back into a hole the next year. But I, it just feels like like they they want him to succeed and it feels like they're they're ready to push him into the spotlight. I I just think this is the this is gonna be the year that, that uh Alexander Walker blows up. Yeah, they definitely want success for him. Yeah, part of the rumored reasoning for Stan Van Gundy's firing is there his insistence to play Eric Bledsoe over Alexander Walker. Of course, Bledsoe's gone, Van Gundy's gone. There's still Josh Hart there, but he'll play a lot at the three behind Ingram and behind Alexander Walker. So I'm pretty confident that Alexander Walker's going to start. He's going to score a lot. He's going to hit a lot of threes. He gets steals at a pretty good rate. He's not the greatest rebounder or passer, but he's going to put up those scoring numbers. I think Kemba's an interesting one. It's, again, we talk about risk and reward because if he actually can be healthy, Tom Thibodeau is not going to hold back on playing him. He won't be on a weird 30-minute limit. I wouldn't have thought. Thibodeau will play him 33, 34 minutes. He'll get plenty of shots, and he'll get opportunities to put up some good numbers. And he was a top 45 guy, I think, over the last two months of last season for Boston after he started to get back into rhythm. The, the problem with him is just, can he sustain that level? And Thibodeau does have other options. There's quickly, there's Rose that he can throw in the net. Now, Tom's not one to necessarily play huge platoons of players. If he finds someone who's best for the job, they'll just get those minutes. But he could try and preserve Kemba because his other you know, love child, Derek Rose, is behind him. So yeah, he wants to give Derek, <laughs> Derek those minutes. So that, that's a tough one. I personally would probably take Kemba just because, again, I'm valuing getting some of those extra assists there, which Alexander Walker doesn't really provide, but Kemba does. But that's going to be dependent, I guess, on, on what I've done earlier in the draft as well. And if you don't take Alexander Walker in that 70 to 80 zone, in most competitive leagues, he's going to be off the board. Now, if it's in an uncompetitive league, he'll be around at 100, 120. But Steve, I'm assuming you're seeing him go off the board a lot earlier than that. Yeah, and maybe Thibodeau can use uh, Emmanuel Quickly's body for parts. <laughs> Okay, he's know, not going to so use him like, for minutes. He's got he's got Kemba and he's got Rose, and if you if you use uh, quickly for spare parts, you know maybe a, a meniscus or a or an ankle, you know uh, maybe we can keep keep everybody healthy this year. Or yep. The ones that the love children, his yeah. love children. Yes, uh, well, let's maybe maybe can uh, RJ Barrett can lend an ankle or two. Who, who knows? Who knows how he's going to run things? That, that <laughs> Knicks lineup is going to be. Pretty wild to watch uh, throughout this season and how uh, how Thibodeau does end up managing it. Steve, that brings us to the end of our show as we went through all of those little uh, little battles there. And uh, thank you again for coming on to the podcast. Now, if anybody doesn't follow Steve, I don't know what you're doing. Go and follow him over on Twitter at uh, Doctora or Dr. A, but with a K in there. You can see it on the screen. I know you've told that story a million times, Steve, as to, to why that is your Twitter handle. People, people still think that you don't know how to spell? Well, I think in Spanish, uh, Doctora is a female nurse, uh, so I've been asked about it. But, but uh, you know, 20 years ago when I signed up for uh, an email address, I, I was trying to do something with Dr. A because, you know, Matthew Berry worked at Roto World, and he was he was the talented Mr. Roto. And when he, he, was, he and I were there at the same time, and I was like, well, if he has a nickname, I, I probably need one. And I was thinking like Dr. J, Dr. A. So I know I'm not a real doctor, but uh, it's supposed to be Dr. A, but it, it just says Doctora. There you go. Go and, uh, go and follow Doctora over there on Twitter. Steve, thanks for coming on the show with me. All right. Thanks for having me, man. And that will do it for today's show. Tomorrow, reminder, mock draft. It's going to be exciting. 14-teamer. I don't remember where I'm picking. I think I'm picking 10 or 11. We'll see how that goes. But follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. Give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below on YouTube. Subscribe and hit that notification bell. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.